Gunderson from Fairwinds, um, and Fairwinds Energy uh, Education is a 501c3 uh, based, in, based in Burlington. The, the founder and the creative talent for, for Fairwinds Energy Education is my wife Maggie, who's sitting behind me, and, uh, and also with us is uh, Caroline Phillips, um, our administrative person, and the guy walking around here with a camera is our video guy, Dave Link. Uh, th thank you for, for having me. Um, the, um, uh, the Linflack Foundation uh, paid Fairwinds to do an analysis of uh, Vermont Yankee. And, and we found that we, we couldn't just look at Vermont Yankee, that there was uh, so much that was tied to nuclear regulation um, that uh, Vermont Yankee is, in fact, just um, uh, an example of, of uh, nuclear regulation. Um, the, um, the Vermont Yankee is the bow wave of, of decommissioning. There's um, a couple out in front or right around the same time. Five nuclear plants shut down last year. Uh, two at San Onofre in California. Uh, one Crystal River in Florida. Um, and, uh, but those are utility owned. Um, two, though, shut down that are limited liability corporations. One is uh, Kiwani <coughs> in Wisconsin and the others from Vermont Yankee. So the experiences on Vermont Yankee and Kiwani are the bow wave. There's about uh, 40 other uh, limited liability corporations uh, that are gonna shut down sometime, whether it's sooner or in the next 25 years. And uh, the remaining 60, roughly, are utility owned. And there is a, there is a difference there. So uh, our thanks to the, um, to the Linthalac Foundation. So the, the report the Linthalic Foundation um, uh, allowed us to write is, uh, is the bound thing. And, and it's available online too, we, uh, um, uh, but we provide it to you with a bound copy. We posted it on the committee page. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the, the full report is uh, roughly a 40 page report that's available online. And then the other one is the cliff notes. So we'll, we'll work off the cliff notes okay. today. There were, we found there were seven financial areas that we wanted to talk about and uh, four safety areas that are Vermont Yankee specific. The financial issues are uh, involve Vermont Yankee but are not really Vermont Yankee specific. The, um, and at the end, there, there is an ask here. Um, and the ask is that I don't think there's a, something as a, a legislative bill that can be produced, but um, I know that the auditor's offices around the nation have a, um, have a group, uh, the same with the public uh, service commissioners, the same with the attorneys general. Um, and um, I guess the ask is that um, at the, uh, as a group of states, if, uh, if you believe these problems that we're identifying are significant, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission does listen to states. And um, even just Vermont showing up at the door means a lot. But if it were 10 states, it means a real lot. So um, the states that are involved, with the, especially with the limited liability corporations, um, uh, we believe should band together and begin to change nuclear law. So, the, the first is, so there's seven financial issues, and then there's, I'll talk about the four safety issues briefly. Um, the first one is, uh, yeah. Yeah. So is there some effort already underway to organize, I don't know if it's auditors or public utility commissions or AGs, I mean, is there something already underway? I don't believe there is. Um, uh, I talked to uh, Chris Recchia and I, he's on board, uh, he sees this pretty clearly, um, but I don't really think he's uh, trying to involve his peers right now. So, um, you know, hopefully that, that, that can happen because uh, Vermont's not the only one, it's just the first. So the, uh, the first concept is this concept, the nuclear industry will call it safe store, uh, but it's spelled S-A-F-S-T-O-R, uh, and your third grade teacher will be rolling over in her grave because that's pronounced SAF store. Rhymes with SAP, not, not safe. Um, safe store, as the nuclear industry would say, but SAF store is a, a 60 year delay 
um, until the nuclear plant can be dismantled. There is no reason in physics why the Nuclear Regulatory Commission chose 60 years. It's a financial mechanism that allows the decommissioning funds to grow, um, but there is no reason in physics why you should wait 60 years to shut a nuclear plant down. Now, the, the nuclear industry position is, well, we have to save the poor workers from the radiation exposure. And uh, uh, the, the, the problem there is that um, when a nuclear plant wants to do a repair and start back up very quickly, uh, they'll give enormous exposures to their employees, um, and you really can't have it both ways. An example is uh, for Vermont Yankee over 60 years, radiation is measured in REM, it's just a number, and the, the workforce will get around 300 REM <laughs> over the, the 60 years to decommission the plant. Um, but Entergy at Palisades did a repair last year in 2014 where in three weeks they dished out 115 REM to their employees to get the plant back up and running again. So um, when a plant needs to start back up, uh, it's dose be damned, but when, uh, uh, when it comes to decommissioning, uh, they'll, they'll hide behind that uh, saying, we need to save our poor workers. Um, our recommendation, and I think Reckia sees, sees eye to eye with this, that there is no reason for safe store in the law. Um, and I'll, I'll get into that a, a little bit later. But this concept of waiting 30, uh, 40, 50, 60 years for this carcass to be removed has no bases in, in, um, uh, in physics. So the, the next thing is um, uh, there's this thing in law 10 CFR 50. And 10 is um, Nuclear Code of Federal Regulations, 50 is power reactors. So 10 CFR 50.75. And this 0.75 paragraph um, is how nuclear plants are, um, uh, how we calculate how much it costs to decommission the plant. And the, so 10 CFR 5075, I'll just say 5075 now instead. But 5075 just says that um, you've, you've got uh, a formula. And the formula is literally a paragraph. There's no construction experience in the formula but you plug in the power level of the plant and the type of plant, BWR, PWR, and the um, age of the plant, and it pops out a number that tells you this is how much it's going to cost, and this is how much money you have to have in your decommissioning fund. The formula's never been right, and it's frequently wrong by a factor of two or three. So this, but, but it's embedded in the law right now, 10 CFR 5075. Um, and pardon me, I mean, yeah. the two or three, is it generally low or high or? It's always low. Yes, it's always low. And now the, the problem is for you as policymakers, we went through this and uh, Maggie and I wrote a report in 07 that showed there was going to be a decommissioning shortfall. And again, in 2012, we, we wrote a report for the Joint Physical Office that showed that uh, there would be a, a decommissioning shortfall. But it's, it's not a transparent process. All you do is um, plug in a couple numbers into this magic formula and out pops a number. Um, so there, there can be, this law was written before Excel spreadsheets. And um, we, Maggie and I, worked with a, a, our science advisor, a guy named Les Cannon, who, by the way, is a, is a great professor over at Johnson State. And we developed a spreadsheet that does this for you. And um, it's, if anybody wants it, uh, the actual working spreadsheet's available on our site. But what we did was we took what's in the fund, and that, that's a number that's known, and we escalated that at 5%. And 5% um, is what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission allows when you're doing these assumptions. So the, the fund is growing at 5%, and uh, Entergy provided in 07 and again in 2012 the costs. And so we escalated the costs at 3%. And as the costs were incurred, the spreadsheet took the cost and removed it from what was available in the fund. It's, it's a real simple spreadsheet. It took us less than 10 days to develop this, um, uh, this spreadsheet and we're, we're making it available to anybody who, uh, who needs it. So our recommendation is that the formula in 10 CFR 5075 
be replaced by an Excel spreadsheet. And it would allow uh, policymakers to make informed decisions about just how much money's in the fund and how that money's gonna be um, spent over time. I know that um, Attorney General Sorrell and, uh, and, and Governor Shumlin faced this problem when they were negotiating with uh, Entergy last year. Exactly when is there gonna be enough money to, um, uh, to get into the fund? Can I ask a quick question? So that, that 3% cost line for the cost of decommissioning the work, is that, um, is that based on prior industry experience? Is that the rate of growth of those costs to date? There's about five different costs in it. Most of them have been growing around 3 or 4%. A couple of them, though, like the cost to dispose of the waste, have been growing faster. So the, the formula may not be accurate, but it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a showstopper. Um, okay, so now that brings me to the, the, the key point in the financial discussion. Um, and the, the decommissioning fund is for decommissioning. And uh, decommissioning is defined in this 5075. Uh, it does not include the cost of spent fuel storage. The decommissioning fund is not designed to support the spent fuel storage fund. Um, a little bit of background there. Um, they were going to build Yucca Mountain. It didn't get built in time. So all of this waste wound up sitting at, at sites around the country. And the process is that utilities or standalones sue the Department of Energy for the cost of spent fuel storage, and there's a litigation, litigation process, and, and they always get it back. Um, and it may take two or three or four years, but if they take $100 million to build a spent fuel storage pad, they then sue Department of Energy, there's a, a legal process, and they get, they get it back. Well, what Entergy did in 07, and again in 2012, and and again, in the estimates they provided you, is they are taking that money out of the decommissioning fund and not assuming they ever get it paid back. Um, it's essentially an interest-free loan from the decommissioning fund. Now, they're asking for an exemption uh, from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission so that they can do this. And it's like, you know, the speed limit on, on 89 is uh, 65 miles an hour, um, but we can pull into the police barracks and ask permission to go 95. Uh, so, and that's basically what they're doing. They're asking for an exemption to tap the fund to take the, um, the spent fuel storage costs out. And that, that's a real cost to Vermonters. Um, essentially, uh, they're, they're asking for about 400 million to be removed from the fund over time, and um, and it's it's at least an interest-free loan. Um, there's no assumption that they pay it back. They're basically assuming that they lose with Department of Energy and they don't pay the money back. So our spreadsheet takes that into account, though. Our spreadsheet shows the the. Um, uh, that, that you do get the, the, the money paid back. Yeah. Is there any history of such exemptions being granted? Yeah. Yes, unfortunately, yeah. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission has rejected some and accepted some. In the main report, we have um, quite a few um, NRC emails um, with Sarah Hoffman when she was over in the department. Um, and of course, I was on the, the, the the oversight panel. So Sarah was sharing uh, emails that she was getting from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which were quite clear that exemptions are not um, um, necessarily approved, but yet Entergy is counting on it. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is. Has, have any states or any jurisdictions where such exemptions have been granted countersued to have the money restored to the fund? I mean, a suit against the. Department of Energy or the NRC for allowing the exemption? They, no, no. And one of the things that uh, we've recommended is that, uh, you know, Commissioner Recchia um, uh, petitioned the NRC not to grant that exemption. And we're, a, we're an interesting party here, interested party, because 
half of any residual in the fund is ours. And at the end of the, at the, end of the process, uh, the deal we cut with Entergy is that half of those funds are ours. So we have a seat at the table is, is, is Fairwind's position. And, um, and you we mean Vermont. Yes, yes. We, not the state of Vermont, but it actually is the rate payers that paid the electric bills. But, and not you and Maggie. No. I just want to clarify the way. I wish we had a, yes, we Vermonters as rate payers to the utilities that owned Vermont Yankee, uh, at the end stand a chance to uh, have a, you know, potentially a $100 million um, um, uh, reduction in our rates out at some point in time. So what we did was we, um, Fairwinds, took the, um, the cost that Vermont Yankee provided and we stripped out the, the spent fuel storage costs. And uh, we ran the calculation through our spreadsheet. And it's the, the first slide on this uh, handout. We show that Vermont Yankee can be completely uh, uh, reduced to a, a farmer's field again by 2032. And, and you know, that's dramatically different than what you're hearing from Entergy. You know, they're out at uh, 2059 and, and things like that. And the, the difference is that Entergy's tapping the fund for something that the NRC has, has specified is not what the fund is for. Um, now, why would Entergy do that? It's, um, oh, Mark's smiling here. <laughs> the, uh, the, and the reason is that it's, it, it, if they were to take the funds from their balance sheet, it's essentially non-productive. They're, they're not, uh, they wind up having more capital on their balance sheet and, and not any new revenues <laughs> to support it. So uh, industry-wide, the nuclear industry has discovered this loophole where they can tap the fund to pay for the independent spent fuel storage, and um, it's not in the law. You know, my experience with the NRC is that uh, if you persist long enough, you'll get the exemption, which allows you to tap the fund. So that's this. The very first slide shows uh, initially uh, costs uh, the amount of the. the um, the y-axis, the up and down axis, is the money that's available. And um, uh, then it, it initially drops. And that's to be expected because you have uh, a period where you're, where, where you're cleaning up the wet systems and, uh, and things like that. You're, you're buttoning down the plant. So costs are gonna drop because you're, you're pulling from the decommissioning fund faster than it's being replenished by the stock market. Um, then there's a, a, a period where it's level, and I, um, when I went through the, the, the actual spreadsheet, that is the second page. The, um, uh, what it shows is that the first five years, you're sucking from the fund faster than it's growing. But then if you just wait five years, if you put the plan in mothballs for five years, which means you have a, a couple of maintenance people making sure the roof doesn't leak, making sure you know, pigeons don't get in, and health physics people to monitor the radiation. Um, just wait five years, the fund will have recovered enough at 5% growth uh, to allow enough funds to completely decommission the plant if spent fuel storage is not included in the, um, in the revenue stream. Um, and, and, and again, the, the spreadsheet's available, and we can tinker. If you don't like 5%, we can run it up to 6 or down to 4. Uh, it's a very flexible uh, spreadsheet that, uh, that Dr. Cannon at, uh, at, at uh, Johnson State developed with me. So um, if, as planners, you had this Excel spreadsheet, a lot of the issues we faced in 07 and 2012 would be off the table. Well, Entergy basically was saying, well, if you let us run to 2032, there'll be enough money in the fund. But there was no visibility of that process. And, and now we've got the, the visibility in the process to strip out the, um, the various components. Um, OK, so that brings me to the, the fourth point, is why do we have 35 years worth of nuclear fuel sitting in the fuel pool? 
The, the original concept of a nuclear power plant was the fuel would sit for five years and then it would be shipped to reprocessing. Uh, reprocessing never happened and Yucca Mountain never happened. So the fuel is building up on site. But there's no reason why it has to be, um, uh, be in the fuel pool. If, if you look at Fukushima Daiichi, uh, they had fuel that had been removed from the fuel pool and was on the ground in dry cast storage. And the dry cast survived the, um, the earthquake and the tsunami just fine. The risk to the public is storing the fuel in the fuel pools, which of course is what happened at Daiichi and why the Nuclear Regulatory Commission said back out for 50 miles. They told Americans not to, uh, um, uh, to evacuate out to at least 50 miles. So spent fuel storage is um, in the wet fuel pool is now being allowed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, and it's actually being encouraged by utilities and reactor owners. Um, it's the same reason that uh, the independent spent fuel storage is. It saves utilities money. If they wait until the plant shuts down, then they believe they can transfer all of that cost to get the fuel out of the fuel pool into the decommissioning fund. So it's a financial instrument from them. Uh, Fairwinds isn't alone in this. Union and Concerned Scientists feel strongly that the fuel is much more dangerous when it's in the fuel pool on the top of Vermont Yankee than if it had been moved to dry cask storage. So if utilities, uh, and again, they're hiding behind the fact we're doing it to save our poor workers exposure, um, then of course the argument of Palisades holds true that if, uh, if you need to get that plan up online, you're going to um, uh, spend money and you're going to irradiate people. But when, the, uh, when it's not a cost to keep the plant running, uh, then they seem to worry more about their, their employees. So it's not, it's not as safe and yet it's perpetuated because utilities feel they can push that, uh, that issue down the road and when it hits decommissioning, they have another source of funds rather than operating revenues. And even if they get the money back <coughs> over uh, four years, you know, they just say, well, it, it, it's gone for four years. Well, $400 million at 5% is 20 million a year times four or five years. There's a hundred million dollar interest-free loan that the fund is giving to Entergy or to Kiwani or any of the other plants. So we're really uh, advocating that the NRC not give exemptions for removal of spent <coughs> fuel um, and as, as is funded from the decommissioning fund. But we feel strongly that, that the plants are not safe if the fuel sits in that pool. Um, now, I actually have a, a great bit of good news, and it's the last two slides on the page, um, the, on, the, on the handout. The, the second to last slide shows the growth in the decommissioning fund over time uh, since 1995. Uh, that was the only information I could have. It actually went back further. Um, and you'll notice it's rather smooth for um, until about 06, and then it gets bumpy after that. And the reason is that monthly data became available from the department um, in about 07 or 08. So the bumpiness in the curve is not indicative of anything except that it's based on monthly data. But the, the, the cool part is that Vermont, the utilities in Vermont controlled that fund from 95 until 202. And, uh, Invested, invested it in the market and got 6.5%. The, the rate of growth in the fund when Vermont utilities were controlling it was 6.5%. When Entergy got it, uh, it's grown at 5.8%. So the, the Vermont um, uh, utilities should pat themselves on the back. They, they were able to grow their fund uh, somewhat faster than, uh, than Entergy did. Both the 5.8 and the 6.5 are greater than the NRC assumption. So I really think the NRC is being conservative here by assuming 5% fund growth. And I think that's a good thing because you know, if you have another stock market retrenchment, you, uh, you get to the point of, of being less than that. 
So um, a pat on the back to the Vermont utilities to get 6.5% uh, and a pat on the back to Entergy to get 5.8% um, over the period that they, uh, they, they owned the decommissioning portfolio. The, um, the, the last two, the last three financial things though are, are another concern. And, and the first one is the uh, issue of limited liability corporations. The, the NRC allowed that to happen about 15, 17 years ago as utilities, the traditional utilities sold off their generating assets they were bought by limited liability corporations. And there were some great thinkers ahead of, uh, as this was happening, that said, this is not a good idea. Uh, Vermont's Peter Bradford is a, a perfect example. Uh, a company called uh, Synergy wrote a report that Bradford actually co-authored uh, that talks about the risks of, of limited liability corporations. And Maggie and I have been talking about this since 07, when we published our first report that um, uh, limited liabilities are there to limit liability. And there's actually four, three, three limited liabilities between Vermont Yankee and Entergy. Um, uh, Vermont Yankee is owned by a limited liability corporation. It's owned by a limited liability corporation. It's owned by another limited liability corporation. Um, the, the net effect of this is that um, if they walk away, uh, the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission says that we'll blow through that and we'll go after the parent company. But every attorney I've ever talked to says that that's why we have limited liability corporations, so you can't blow through it. Um, and in the main report, we have statements from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission basically saying that we will blow through it. And then we have statements from Entergy uh, clearly saying that in 60 years, uh, they will enter into litigation with the state of Vermont um, if, uh, if they run out of funds. So um, the two parties here, and Vermont's kind of stuck in the middle, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's um, concept of the laws that exist is entirely different than w the way it's being interpreted by, uh, by Entergy. So, um, I, I won't go into the exact quote, but trust me, I, I'm sure you've seen them in the papers, but uh, Susan Small here has done a phenomenal job of identifying um, what the NRC said. And basically, um, we will fight and make sure that the ultimate corporate parent is responsible. And um, Dave Graham has done a great job covering uh, uh, Vice President Toomey's comments here that basically said that uh, uh, no, at the end of 60 years, um, we'll come back and go after the uh, utilities that previously owned the plant to cover costs. And I, th that's an issue that I don't think we should wait 60 years to find out about. Um, that, you know, we're, we're basically uh, deferring a potential liability. Um, so limited liability corporations were not, that the NRC didn't think about at the end of life, what do you do for a power plant? Uh, when they allowed these limited liability corporations. Um, the, um, related to that, we all know that part of the deal that was cut in, 20, in 2002 was that um, um, the state would share 50-50 any remaining funds in the decommissioning fund. And you know, if we go back to that slide, there's $100 million left in 2032. Um, as, as I interpret the MOU, Entergy gets half that and, um, and the state rate payers uh, get half that. So there's a potential $50 million windfall to the rate payers of, uh, of, of Vermont. Um, attached to this main report at the back is a, is a long letter um, to, um, uh, to the Assistant Attorney General and to, uh, and to Mr. Recchia um, from Entergy. And uh, it, it's a pretty nasty piece of work. Uh, the, the, um, the point, though, is that Entergy is now claiming, at least in that letter, that um, it is the um, a FERC of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, that controls who gets that money and not it's not bound by the original MOU. 
Uh, so um, uh, we're basically seeing that same issue of, you know, if you don't like it, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll litigate. The, the last financial issue um, is that um, uh, the fund is not auditable. And uh, you know, I, would, I would hope that uh, the state auditor, you know, Hoffer, would uh, um, uh, become involved. Um, that what, what happened was, again, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission didn't think about um, uh, limited liability corporations. When a utility <laughs> owned the fund, there were checks and balances, and the Public Service Commission would oversee the auditing of the, um, of the fund. But neither the, the NRC does not audit, does not do financial audits. And it seems to me that the state of Vermont is precluded from doing a, a financial audit. Well, the, the net effect of that is that um, Entergy can, um, Entergy has a, a, um, a subsidiary called TLG Services that does decommissioning work. And they are funneling this decommissioning work to TLG services. Um, and my question is, has there been a competitive bid? Uh, I don't believe so. And uh, th basically, they're, they couldn't make money when the plant was running. But they now have a profit center to do decommissioning analysis um, so they can funnel the entire decommissioning fund through this wholly owned subsidiary and essentially strip out uh, uh, inordinate amounts of profits. So our- Are you surprised? <laughs> um, no. Uh, so my point is that uh, you know, uh, uh, Doug Hoffer does some phenomenal work uh, auditing different functions. And I would hope, because again, half of the excess of the fund is ours. I would hope oh, that- But you gotta, if you deplete the fund and there's there's nothing left. And it all goes to your own, your own in-house subsidiary or cousin. Um, <coughs> you, know, you don't have to split what you've embezzled. You know, so. Right. Well, you, and you know, this is the problem here is that uh, it's an LLC. If uh, back in the back in the old days when it was owned by Vermont Utilities, the Public Service Commission or Department of Public Service could um, um, could intervene, could watch the process, could make sure that there was competitive bids. Uh, we don't have that as it stands now. And I don't see any indication that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission wants to assume that function. Uh, by, by the way, this report we, we, uh, that, that the Linfolac Foundation um, provided uh, the funds for was given to the NRC uh, as part of the public comment period. And it, um, we actually have the acceptance, the NRC has it in their possession. But they have not made it a, a public document yet. So we will see over the months to come what the NRC's reaction to that issue will be. Because the issue of auditing these funds is one of the ones that, um, that we brought to the, uh, the NRC's um, attention. So that, that's it for financial. I've got four safety issues. Uh, they're relatively quick. First off is emergency planning. Um, and uh, I, I know Commissioner Recchia has been uh, an advocate that we've got to keep the emergency plan in place until the nuclear fuel is safely out of the fuel pool onto the ground. Um, I couldn't agree more. Um, there's three senators, um, Boxer from California, Markey from uh, Massachusetts, and Bernie Sanders, who are also asking for that. Um, they're all Democrats, they're all outvoted. I don't think it will go anywhere. But the Nuclear Regulatory Commission does pay attention to states. So if enough states feel that we should have an emergency plan, I would think that there might be some leverage there. That, you know, we've had near misses during Safe Store um, at Dresden out in uh, Illinois back in the uh, 90s. Um, the, the uh, pipe froze and the nuclear fuel pool began to drain. They lost 60,000 gallons from the nuclear fuel pool and it was heading down pretty quick. In another day, the fuel pool would have drained and the, and the, um, the x-ray cloud coming out of the fuel pool would have been so high they would have had to evacuate the site. So SAF store really isn't safe store. And the other example is Fukushima 
where the fuel pool uh, in Unit 4 was, um, was on the hairy edge of causing the entire site to be evacuated too. So until the, water's out, until the fuel is out of the fuel pool, I think we <coughs> should have an emergency plan in place. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission's position is that, well, the, if there's an accident in the fuel pool, the radiation, whatever little bit there is, won't leave the site. That it will be in the, what's called the owner-controlled area. Uh, and that's Entergy's position, is that the calculations show that it'll stay in the owner-controlled area. Um, if that's true, they should give up their liability insurance. Right? We have, we have Price-Anderson liability insurance to protect the people. And uh, if you're claiming now that the plant is perfectly safe and no radiation is going to leave the site boundaries, they should renounce their Price-Anderson insurance, uh, which, of course, has not happened. Um, so first issue is keep the emergency planning in place until, until five years out. And that should come from the fund. I, I don't have any problem with that. Is that the uh, issue? I think it is. Yes. I think it is, yes. They don't mind the emergency planning being it, in place. Be. The state of Vermont picks up the tab. Right. That, you know, it's about that's two, the, two that's million the a year coming out of the fund. Right now the fund is growing at 30 or 40 million a year. It's a cost. If we Vermonters feel it's, it's important, we should bear it. Um, but the nuclear industry doesn't want it. And I think that uh, uh, Entergy is just you know, uh, uh, spouting the, the company line. Um, so, but related to that is that um, uh, the other part, so we, we, we know that uh, it's obviously safer than when it was running, but it's not completely safe until that fuel's on the ground and in the dry cast storage. Um, and if you remember, I'm probably the only person in the state who remembers this, but in 08, um, there was a, the brakes failed on the crane as it was lifting fuel. Um, and uh, um, so as it was, the, this, this crane is designed to handle about 120 tons. And they were lifting about a 100 ton canister of spent fuel and the brakes failed. Uh, now, it, it didn't go into full screaming down the, the but the, they couldn't control it. It went down and down and down and down and down. And down. Um, so we have a history in Vermont of the brakes failing. So the other thing that we're recommending to the NRC is that when you move fuel, and you have to move fuel, and it's important that you do move fuel, do it when the school's not in session. I mean, there's kids right across the street, 4,500 4, feet away. Now, they can wait until the summer to do this, um, or they can do it on holidays or whatever. But it just, to me, makes no sense to uh, be moving nuclear fuel at a reactor that had a brake failure already. Um, and and the, the risk is remote. There's no doubt about it that, that uh, we all hope and pray. But why not get the kids on, um, on holidays, weekends, or whatever, and move the fuel then? It just seems to me to be a, a prudent thing to do. Last two things. Um, you, you're aware that they found strontium-90 on the site in the groundwater. The, um, uh, when Maggie and I wrote a report for the uh, Joint Fiscal Office, and we recommended um, uh, constant monitoring of the, of the ground mortar. We also recommended that the extraction wells continue to be operated. Uh, that didn't happen. The Entergy shut the extraction wells down. And um, I just read that uh, Entergy is going to stop the monitoring wells, at least it's going to stop the Department of Health's access to the monitoring wells in about six months. So we don't know where that strontium is, is going, but we do know the groundwater movement on that site is from the nuclear reactor toward the Connecticut River. Um, the, the position that Fairwinds has taken is, I know where that, that strontium-90 is coming from, and it's from that advanced off-gas building, the one that, that uh, had the leak back in, uh, well, the leak started in 07, but it was discovered in 10, 2010. Um, we can decommission that piece of the plant now. And uh, we know, uh, when I was on the oversight panel, they had done borings under the AOG building, Advanced Off Gas Building, and they know that there's strontium under the building. So why not decommission that building now? Um, it would be funds for, the, for Brattleboro. You know, there's potentially a $50 million construction project here. 
which would help an area that could use the work. But more importantly, it stops, it, you know, all the horses are not out of the barn. Some of the horses are, but we can get the horses that are in the barn and pick them up and, and store it. So one, our, our, uh, one of our major technical recommendations is get the, uh, get the fuel, uh, get the, the radioactive material out of the ground, clean up the AOG building now. You gotta do it anyway, it's in the estimate. Before it gets to the river? It's a pay me now or pay me later, but pay me later on steroids, you know, that if this stuff starts to spread throughout the site as it moves out of the plume, the costs are greater. So let's, it just seems to me to be more prudent from the from a cost standpoint to, to pick up that AOG building now and, um, and bottle up the, what radiation is leaking out. Uh, last point, and I know Dr. Irwin and I see eye to eye on this, is that um, the NRC's release criteria to give the site back to the state is they, you can't find radiation down to three feet. Uh, below that, they don't, they don't care, they don't look. Well, we know we've got strontium-90 in the groundwater now at 20 or 30 or 40 feet. So we're asking, uh, and I, I know that Dr. Irwin in his comments made the same recommendation that Fairwinds did, that uh, the release criteria is not appropriate for when you know you have a, a, a leak and uh, this is not something that can, uh, that can be walked away from. So in, in closing, uh, I, you know, I testify all over the country. I've testified in California and Florida and Georgia and South Carolina. Uh, it's, it's nice to be in this building where people are, um, are where, where the legislators pay attention to the, the citizens. It's nice to be back, um, so thank you. And I got you back on schedule. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I, I just have a process question. So I you know, hear about these things, but when you say them, I go, oh, I'm not quite <laughs> sure I caught all that. So can you just walk through very briefly the tasks? So they, they shut down the reactor, and that involves removing the fuel rods from the reactor, right? And they go into the spent fuel pool. Right. Okay. And then... <clears throat> What's the next step from there? They are removed from the pool and they go where? To dry cask storage? Yes. Okay. It takes um, the, um, the fuel that's in the reactor most recently stays physically hot for about five years and it can't be in dry cask storage. Um, but there's 39 years worth of fuel or 35 years worth of fuel in the pool, uh, some of which could be removed right now. Um, but at the end of the day, you, you, uh, to do dry cask so that air can cool it, you've got to wait five years. Um, it's also in, uh, Entergy has to have licensed reactor operators monitoring the fuel pool uh, because it's mechanical. It's, a, it's not passive. It's a, there are active systems, pumps and heat exchangers that have to run all the time. Seismically qualified pumps and heat exchangers have to run all the time. So um, after five years, when you begin to remove the fuel, might be six years, but around that, um, after five or six years, you can then um, you're, you're, you can reduce cost dramatically because you don't have to keep uh, the, the engineers keeping things running, the mechanics keeping things running, and the operators, um, the, the licensed operators. So it's a cost reduction that occurs about five years out. And how many years' worth of spent fuel is in the pool currently? Um, it's full. <laughs> is it um, just the last they, five years? No. no, no. They removed, uh, eat, there's six canisters of fuel uh, on the pad right now. And they removed that fuel to make room for more fuel. And now the fuel pool is cooled again. So they never completely emptied the pool. Again, the, the goal was they paid for removing those canisters and they sued Department of Energy and got some money back. That came out of Entergy's budget. How many more canisters worth of fuel I think, have yet to be I removed? I think about 30. Okay, so it's... Yeah, it could be 35 or 25, but it's around 30 more canisters on a thick pad that's seismically qualified. And if they could empty the pool completely, then you're saying, you know, then they don't have to have operators there, they're not running pumps, all the rest. So is it that, <clears throat> as best you know, their, their goal, because it, it reduces the ongoing cost of that plant before, you know, the other decommissioning costs are addressed? Yes. 
that I think it's every utility and every reactor operator in the country's goal is to empty the pool five or six years out. The question is who pays for it. Okay. And then the other question is, in that sequence of events, when does decommissioning actually begin as opposed to managing the plant you already just own? Um, Where's that line on the... Well, they are, you know, officially they are in decommissioning now, and that means that the NRC resident inspectors don't live in Vermont anymore and you know, things like that. Um, so that the official, uh, there's a, a, a transfer that occurs when they notify the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that it's over. But the actual dismantlement of the plant um, uh, occurs when there's funds to see it through. How long was it between when Maine stopped producing power, Maine Yankee, and it went through the five-year phase? When did they begin to dismantle the plant and well, you can, in the way? You know, we, we could be dismantling parts of Vermont Yankee now. You know, the, the turbine hull doesn't, is not uh, terribly radioactive and things like that. But uh, eventually, you've got to consolidate it down to the spent fuel pool if you want it to. So Maine was done in, in 10 years. Connecticut Yankee was done in 10 years. Um, Connecticut Yankee, as they were doing it, they discovered a leak of strontium-90 into the aquifer that um, ran up their cost by hundreds of millions of dollars. But it wasn't a limited liability corporation. It was a utility. And those hundreds of millions got spread out over everybody in Connecticut, 8 million people, a lot bigger state than ours. And they agreed to spread the cost out over 10 years so that um, uh, uh, the issue of a strontium leak to the, to the aquifer has been faced and is significant, but it's never been faced with an LLC. Thank you so much. Thank you, much. Thank All right, you, thank very, you much. very much, and thanks to the Lindholm Foundation. Thank, yes, thank you.